Yo, what's good, original crew, man? We're back. We got more of the darkest moments in TV history. This is part four. So I think we didn't we didn't caught up with these. Uh, we'll start doing other things. I always drop uh, y'all recommendations and suggestions uh, in the comment section down below of other things y'all might want to see, especially from Nick's uh, channel, uh, like other series he has done. Let us know which one y'all think will go great for the channel. And that's interesting. Not just your favorite, but something that's very interesting. Yeah. So with that being said, before we get into it, make sure you check out the links in the description box. Down below. You already know where to go if you want to first support. All you have to do is check out down below. Also, if you enjoyed today's visuals. Like it with a thumbs up. But let's hop into it, man. Let's check it out. Let's see what's about you. Ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Trying to work it opening, but Singleton brings it away for Bradford. There's only Ellis with him at the moment, though, and he's played it straight to Redford. And uh, an offside flag this time against John Thomas. Saturday, May 11th, 1985. A soccer match is underway in Bradford, West Yorkshire, England, between the visiting team Lincoln City and the home team Bradford City, a group riding the high of having just won their divisional championship in the week prior. This was the season finale for the club, one last match for the team and the fans to cap off what was otherwise a historic run. However, it wasn't just the season that this game would mark the end of. At the time, Bradford City played their matches at a site called Valley Parade Stadium, with the facilities growing a reputation around the league as being incredibly outdated, and to many, downright neglected. The awnings that stretched over the fans were made of old rotted wood, while underneath the stands were heaps of old trash that would pile up all throughout the season and rarely if ever be cleaned. The whole place was a mess, and the city knew it too, which eventually led to their decision to just rebuild the stadium completely, with plans being set to tear the whole thing down soon after the game would end. But as it turns out, fate wasn't willing to wait quite that long. Within the stands, a spectator was watching on enjoying a cigarette, taking one last drag before flicking it out of his hands. I still locked intently on the game, failing to notice that the cigarette butt had slipped through the floorboards of the bleacher and landed on the ground below. This almost immediately caused a small fire to break out, which was noted by the commentator John Helm. We've actually got a fire in the stand on the far side of the ground. And that looks very nasty indeed. Spread Despite the cigarette fast. only being dropped a minute or so before, the fire was already visible from the stands, as within that old stadium was the perfect makings of a disaster. Yeah. When that cigarette fell to the ground, it didn't just land on the grass, because the grass was likely not even visible at that point, and was buried under mounds and mounds of garbage, garbage that acted as the perfect kindling for the blaze. Yeah. And that wasn't all. Remember, one of the main sticking points of the rebuild was the fact that the awnings that reached above the fans were made entirely of that old wood, meaning that you had heaps of kindling, tons of wood, and now a spark, with the final fatal factor being that it was a windy day. It was the perfect storm, and the results were devastating. It took approximately three minutes for that small fire to engulf the entirety of the stands, as the black smoke billowed into the sky and the crowd desperately rushed to the field to get away from the heat. And the whole place is scorching. It's that fucking fast, bro. That was fast. It takes no time. That's crazy. Damn, the whole thing is just... Gone. Y'all don't even give two. Well, it was 1985 yeah. time. Uh, and people always talk about how great Pat, like a lot of stuff. 
you get better with time, right? Mm-hmm. Like as far as awareness and knowledge, yeah. and folks just always, I want to go back to when times was great. Like Nick, no, mm-hmm. I want all, no, nothing. Talking about having a new ground at Valley Parade, they might soon have to have one because this is the day that Valley Parade I'm Football Club, out, okay. the football ground, is burning down. The footage is highly disturbing so much so that I can't show the entire thing. But during this time, however, a radio broadcast was on air, with the audio giving us a good idea of just how chaotic the scene was and the moments when the blaze really erupted. And we're on fire here at Valley Parade. The whole end of the stand at one side is actually in flames. Now I can see the orange of the flames. The game is actually stopped here at Valley Parade. And people are running around. They're running around beside us. They're running around all around us. And people are saying, get onto that pit. The whole stand is on fire, Tony. It's an absolute, it's spreading quickly. There's going to be, there's going to be problems, Tony. Let's get all those people out of there. Let's get those people. Just take your time. Don't rush. Don't push. Wait for the kiddies. People are coming around us. You can hear the heat. The smoke coming everywhere. We are going to have to disconnect very shortly because it really is craving all the time. We're taking a break. We're getting out of it. In the stands that day were approximately 6,000 people, and based on the footage, many of whom were able to run to safety very quickly, which gave a sense of hope that the ordeal might end in minimal casualties. Though there was another side of things. Those who chose not to run towards the field opted to go the opposite way, as there was an entrance and exit located directly behind the stands where the fire had started. And when the crowd managed to make their way to this exit, they were met with a disturbing revelation. The gates were shut, and those that were open or busted open were also blocked by slow-moving turnstiles, some of which being locked themselves. And as the crowd began pushing more and more to get through these turnstiles, it in turn led to a crush of humanity, with everyone piling on top of one another as the fire slowly consumed them. Yeah, the best exit would have been the field. Yeah. Like, to go that, because... Especially since yeah. it's already, like, this way. Yeah, and, it could, and you could have got trapped by the fire. Because it's, it's going so fast. So sad. Damn. When the smoke cleared and the bodies were counted, 56 had tragically lost yeah. their lives, while another 265 were left with serious injuries, with a tragedy leading to numerous new safety standards for soccer stadiums across the country as Valley Parade's notoriously bad reputation had finally caught up with it on its very last day of operation, mm-hmm. marking one of the deadliest days in the world of soccer and one of the darkest moments in television history. Bodies are being dragged away from that stage. That recorded the man's actions as he was taping a special yeah, program. Oh my God, oh my God. The world of television is no stranger to death-defying stunts. From the very beginning of broadcasting, viewers have been captivated by the sight of people risking their lives to pull off these seemingly impossible spectacles. But while most of these performances are done by trained professionals, perhaps one of the strangest television stunts ever performed was one done by a man with hardly any training at all, Adelir Antonio de Carli. Born in Pelotas, Brazil, Adelir felt a calling early in his life to dedicate himself to God. This eventually led to him becoming a Catholic priest where he developed a deep connection with those in his community. To many, Adelir was considered a man of the people, someone who had a passion for religion and a goal to make it accessible to as many people as possible, which is where he developed the idea for his most infamous project. Near his home in Brazil was a popular port city named Paranagua, which saw the import and export of a vast array of goods, making it a central hub for truckers to drive to and from on a regular basis. But Adelir began to realize that for these truckers, the vast majority of their lives were lived on the road, and this rarely, if ever, allowed them to practice their religion. This revelation inspired Adelir to start putting together plans to build a chapel at a trucker's rest stop right in Paranagua, which would allow for drivers to stop and worship while on the road. In theory, this seemed like a great idea, and one that the community could easily rally behind, though there was just one issue. 
the money. Building a chapel and maintaining it was not going to be cheap, and far exceeded what was possible with just his salary, making the whole thing seem like more of a dream than anything, unless he could somehow find a way to raise the funds. Which is when he had the idea. He was going to create a public spectacle. One where he would attach himself to hundreds of helium-filled balloons and take off into the sky in a process known as balloon clustering. Believe it or not, this was actually a somewhat well-known stunt at the time, as popularized by a man named John Ninomia, whose footage was shown on numerous television stations a few years prior in 2006. And perhaps having been inspired by this, Adelir viewed the stunt as the perfect opportunity to fund his chapel with his plan being to break the world record of 19 hours in the air, and in doing so, use the publicity to gather donations. But the only problem was, he had no experience whatsoever. He had gone skydiving numerous times before though, and he believed that his familiarity with that would help him to break the record in no time. And so, on January 13th, 2008, in the city of Umperi, Brazil, over 600 balloons were filled with helium and attached to a chair, which Adelir was then strapped to. He began to lift off the ground, quickly floating high in the sky, as the news camera- Is that possible where they got the idea from up? The movie. Oh, I was about to say, well, this would have- Yeah, possibly. Because, what year did up come out? Mm. He said, well, no. No, I doubt it. That was done in 2008. The movie came in 2009, so it would have took longer for them to even come up with the concept to even and do the imagery for it. So, nah. Just coincidence. Horrible coincidence. But I guess people have been doing it before then, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, um, like, like the, the idea for the balloon. But I get what you, oh, the, yeah. I get what you're saying. Mm -mm. We're there to film it all. The flight saw him travel roughly 17 miles and reach an altitude of 17,000 feet, highlighting just how dangerous of a stunt this really was. But despite his lack of experience, after around four hours, he would touch down safely in Argentina, marking the end of his first successful flight. It was a promising start and inspired Adelir to continue planning and prepping for his next attempt, which he resoundingly told people would break the world record. In preparation for doing so, he took part in various jungle survival training exercises and even took up mountain climbing as he knew he would be flying over remote regions which left him at risk of being stranded somewhere in the wilderness. To further aid in this, Adelir would also have a satellite phone and a GPS which he would use in tandem to help track his location and call for assistance should things go awry. It seemed that Adelir was ready for anything. But on April 20th, 2008, as a crowd gathered around to see this man attempt this record, the weather began to take a turn for the worst. During his first flight, the skies were sunny and the winds were calm, but on this day, it was gloomy and the rain was falling hard off and on, putting the whole stunt in jeopardy. But Adelir remained confident, boasting that thanks to God, he would have perfect weather when he was on his flight. Porque eu vou subir acima dela. 10 minutos eu ultrapasso ela. E depois vou voar sempre em tempo bom. And despite some trying to convince him to push things back, he knew that the crowd was there for him. And this was his chance to secure funding for his dream project. Com essa quantidade de balões, o padre deve viajar a cerca de 5 mil metros de altitude. Com ele lá em cima, vão estar ainda um telefone celular por satélite, GPS. Chegando a Dourados, no Mato Grosso do Sul. O tempo estava fechado, mas o padre insistiu em voar. Era uma da tarde quando ele subiu, levado por mil balões de gás coloridos. Pretendia bater o recorde. And with that, he was off, soaring quickly into the sky, where he eventually disappeared into those thick rain clouds. For essentially all of his flight, those clouds made it practically impossible to see the man, which was further exasperated by the fact that this time he had used 1,000 balloons, as opposed to 600, which brought him to an even higher elevation, this time touching almost 20,000 feet. But just because he was out of sight, that didn't mean that we couldn't hear from him, as he would soon call down to a local news station to share a somewhat concerning update. <laughs> Despite dedicating countless hours of training before the flight, there was one thing that Adelir had failed to prepare for, the GPS. 
as he was never shown how the device actually worked, and he only realized that he had no idea how to operate it once he was already at his peak altitude, meaning that he was essentially flying blind. The course he had set out on was set to see him travel 400 miles inland to a city named Dorados, and by his prior calculations, the wind should have still been taking him at the very least in that direction, which for a moment gave him a sense of calm, as he trusted the preparation even if he didn't know his exact coordinates. But after a few hours as the moon began to rise, so too did the panic within Adelir, as he caught a glimpse of a strange sight on the horizon. The ocean. Somehow, the wind had done a complete 180, and had blown him in the exact opposite direction that he had prepared for, and before he knew it, he was flying directly over the sea, with no way of stopping himself or even slowing himself down, as he was now flying alone into pitch blackness. Mm. Adelir called his team and requested they send rescue, but there was no way to give his exact location, and by this point, he was already nearly 40 miles out to sea. After being just 8 hours into his 20 hour flight, the ground team would lose contact with Adelir after receiving a message from him begging for his rescue, and he would never be heard from again. Wow. Up, up, and away. A Catholic priest trying to break a record for most hours flying with helium filled party balloons vanishes into thin air. The subsequent search for Adelir was broadcast heavily all across the world, with the media dubbing him as the Balloon Priest. And after nearly nine days of searching, the only sign of the man was his balloons. They were found detached and floating in the ocean, with there being no sign of the priest whatsoever, leaving his fate as a total mystery. At least at the time. At the time. On July 4th, 2008, a tugboat sailing off the coast of Mackay near an offshore oil rig would spot something floating in the water, and upon closer inspection, it would be identified as a body. Or at least part of one, given all that remained was the subject's lower half. Jeez. And upon DNA testing, it was confirmed that it did in fact belong to Adelir Antonio de Carli, who likely crashed into the water and drowned, only to be picked away at by various predators of the ocean, thus ending the balloon priest's saga in a tragic, yet for many, unsurprising manner. But he he had the science was there not to do it, and I don't care how much preparation y'all had, y'all had preparation for a clear air, yeah, not for a storm. And the equipment that you had, you didn't even know how to use, right? Which the GPS is definitely import, important if you want them to know where you at, so that they can locate you, you know. In case of an emergency or anything, or whenever you land, or whatever the case may be. Like the weather alone, I would have just called it off. Yeah. I'm pretty sure people would have understood and like, okay, we'll another, another be day. back. Because, you know, people want you to be safe. Because so, with, with the weather, you can predict. Dang, nothing was sad. predictable. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Everything was going to be unpredictable because a swift of an eye, the storm could have changed direction, which changes the wind direction, which would have changed the whole direction, of course. So... That was doomed from the beginning. As soon as he went in the air, it's like, all right, there's literally no coming back. Yeah. Like, because especially even once you was in the air, I wonder could they have, like, all right, you don't have the equipment. We don't have the proper net thing necessary. I wonder could they have even, when he reached out to him and contacted him, could they have put a stop to it then? You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. What you looking at me like that for? You just looking. No. Like, I'm saying, could you could you have ended it mid-flight already and, like, be like, hey, you might need to come back in. Yeah. Like, we'll do this another day. You get what I mean? Mm hmm I don't know, man. I would have, personally, myself, I would have said, hey, we'll have to rain check, literally rain check it. Yeah, fact. Because it's not, but, it's hey. It's not looking good. Yeah. Some people be too stubborn, headstrong. To focus on the one like his, goal. It, yeah, his goal was just to, you know... Even though I know money. you did it for try to... But it's also... the the Some of the actions were kind of selfish, too, because you were trying to... I'm going to I'm gonna beat the record. I'm going to... You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's like... You got to... Mm. I hear you. Devastating. That's sad, though. 
Night is the most dangerous time for pedestrians along streets and highways. To be on the safe side, walk facing traffic and wear light-colored clothing for quicker recognition by approaching drivers. Now, once you get into a, a car with somebody, uh, you're at their mercy. If your car should become disabled, the rule of thumb is stay inside. There are signs you can get to put on the back window to summon for help. It was the waning days of 1986. New station NBC7 San Diego records and broadcasts a PSA segment about safety on the roads, and specifically what to do if your car breaks down at night. This may seem like a fairly random topic, but for residents of San Diego, fears were rising over just how safe their highways were. As just a few days prior, a 20-year-old college student named Kara Knott had gone missing, only for her car to be found pulled over onto the shoulder of a tall bridge, where underneath, police would find her body, having been strangled brutally and tossed over the side to the ground below. Understandably, residents were concerned, with many assuming that she had ran into car troubles and likely exited her vehicle to get help, only to be kidnapped and killed by a nearby motorist. And due to this, NBC7 thought this segment would be effective in educating those out there in the hopes of avoiding another situation like Kara's, especially considering at this point, her killer was still somewhere out there. For the video, they even had a highway patrol officer come out to share his tips. Uh, being a female, you could be robbed if you're a male, um, all the way to where you could be uh, killed. Uh, once you get in that other person's car, you're at their mercy. As well as a man whose car had broken down when they were filming. Do you realize how dangerous it is? Yes, I realize. In fact, I was putting the gas in and an uh, 18 wheeler came by and almost blew me away. Overall, the segment appeared relatively harmless, with the main messaging being to contact authorities and wait for their assistance rather than trusting a stranger. But still, this how the hell in 85, was 86, you gonna contact the authorities? If you're stranded on the side of the road. <laughs> Nowadays, it's easy. Yeah, I'm, I'm but it's 86. That ain't, that ain't as easy as it said. Mm -hmm. You still gonna have to get out the car, gonna have to walk. Yeah. So hopefully a nearby, if there, hopefully there's a nearby, uh, like, payphone. Yep. Yeah, something. Hopefully, or nearby a truck stop. Hopefully, but that could be miles away. Facts. So, oh, how times have Especially gotten better. Especially if you want though. me to like stay in my car, like how? What? I well, they said something about they have the signs or something. So I guess you. Hoping no, they have signs to have stickers you can have on back on of the your back car. of your car for to get help. Like so little saying, bumper stickers. Most of the so, time, you pass somebody and say, "Hey, I need help." You like you know how fast people are going. It's like I'm really see a pay. Oh, this guy stood down. He got this on his bumper sticker. Yeah, I let thought me they were saying like put like a little sign in a window or something like give him. Mm. I didn't tell. I don't still, know. still but the still, concept don't even make especially sense. Especially if it's at nighttime. I'm but not I, understand, seeing it. I understand the time period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're you're they're doing what they can with what they they're have. They're ignorant to to the success of some of the stuff that they like. They're saying things, but in reality, it doesn't just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it does. For at that time, it probably did. It still didn't make. Still, maybe, maybe, maybe for, that time. But, but for you, it doesn't because you have all these other resources. So yeah, it, it wouldn't just make still sense. Don't make sense. <laughs> I mean, but when you don't have, even if we don't have these resources, it still don't make sense. I got you. They they need to bring back pay phones. Did little to calm the public's nerves as paranoia rippled through the community and speculation began to run rampant on who was responsible for Kara's death, which is when disturbing allegations began to emerge. Following this report, 24 separate women would come forward to share their bizarre encounters wow. that they had had on that very same road in which Kara was found. Wow. The girls claimed that they were pulled over by a police officer who interrogated them in their cars for upwards of two hours. And the questions oh. being asked during this weren't even relevant to the alleged violations they had committed. Instead, they were more personal, sometimes even sexual, wow. as if the man was trying to seduce them. And it got stranger from there, as when looking into that cop's work record, it was discovered that he was on patrol the night in which Kara had gone missing, and he just so happened to be working that very same stretch of highway. 
And making things even more concerning was the fact that underneath Kara's fingernails were traces of what appeared to be fabric that matched the material used to make police uniforms. Mm. And hidden in the officer's trunk was heavy rope, with it eventually being revealed that Kara had rope marks around her neck, implying that that's how she was killed. But what does make these accounts so important and so relevant to the topic at hand was the fact that the officer being named by every single one of these women was a man named Craig Allen Pyre. Spotting pedestrians at night is difficult. And once you get into a, a car with somebody, uh, you're at their mercy. Because if you do decide to walk, the CHP says you never know who you may meet along the road. Anything could happen. The very same officer that was shown in the local news report. Oh shit! I, I looked at you like the audacity not, for you. Anything can happen. You the one like what? I'm not. I didn't. I wasn't looking to even put two and two Big together. Sideburns. Wow. Like what? I wasn't really? looking at it. I was like, I was looking at my bad. I, 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 I was in my head like, thinking, thinking of some stuff, and I'm like, bro, that's crazy. And I'm not looking and putting two to two together. It's the same Anything motherfucker. Anything can happen. Sir, you are supposed to be here to protect and, and serve. This. Like, what are you doing? Peep this. Anything can happen. You can run into me. Facts. Seriously. Like, wow. for real. Like, and people that's getting in the car, these women that are getting in the car with you, or whatever the case may be, because I guess you're stopping them, or maybe they are stopped along the road, or whatever the case may be, they're trusting you because... You are, you know. Facts, facts. That remind me of the, the situation that happened in Oklahoma with that police officer that, I don't know, that he was like, he didn't murder anyone, but he was a serial. Oh. And so he used to assault a lot of women. He wow. would pull them over. So they, he'd be like, he'll like pat, pat them down, yeah. groping them and touching yeah. on them. And, and then it's, on some occasion, he even had... You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Intercourse with him and it just, but he went to jail for all. He he basically in jail. I think he took jail advantage for, of him. I, I'm saying he took a not that. I'm saying he's in jail. He got convicted, and I think he's gonna be in jail for. Uh, he might be in jail for life. What? No, you said he nothing. Just come on. Oh, you are talking about that? Yeah, I yeah, said yeah, took yeah, advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying what he did. You may meet along the road. Anything could happen. The very same officer that was shown in the local news report. It would eventually be revealed that on December 27th, 1986, Craig Allen Pyre pulled over Kara Knott, flirted with her, whipped her, strangled her, and then threw her body off a bridge only two days later appear on this PSA and try and teach the public how to avoid being kidnapped and killed alongside of the highway. All the way to where you could be uh, killed. Uh, once you get in that other person's car, you're at their mercy. If strangers wow. should offer assistance, tell them to call police or the CHP. Yeah, just stay in the vehicle, lock all the doors, uh, turn on the emergency flashers, uh, and wait for uh, the help to come. It's so incredibly haunting to watch this segment back, especially considering what he's saying, knowing that he was quite literally the cause of the crime that inspired the segment to begin with. Just two weeks after the program aired, Officer Craig Pyre would be arrested for the murder of Kara Knott, where he was eventually sentenced 25 years to life in prison. Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. One of the most famous natural spectacles in the world. Oh my God! Oh my God! Considered one of the most visually stunning locations in the United States, and even across the world, the three waterfalls that make up Niagara Falls offer a unique blend of beauty and violence, making it no wonder why tens of thousands of people visit the area every day just to take in the awe-inspiring views and that unbelievable rush of water. But on March 20th, 2003, as a typical crowd gathered to take their photos, their attention was captured by something far different than the scenery, something that couldn't have been possible. It looked like a man in the water. Though he wasn't being swept over and he wasn't moving at all, he was just standing there at the very edge of the falls, staring off into oblivion. 
Police were immediately called to the scene as a panic arose, and within minutes, rescue crews would begin their work, along with a cameraman from a local news station. <laughs> You'll just get there by accident. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. I'm like, I was trying to like tell is it like a middle age or older? Like, he's, you know, he's like older. Elderly. Nah, not like not, not like that elderly, 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 like, but like he looks of that time. Maybe, maybe like in his late forties. Of that time, could have been late thirties. You know, yeah, time. Okay. You know, yeah, I feel you aging. <laughs> but but ha like what? Okay. Could have been late 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to age him like that, but. And at the end, I don't know if it was just me, but was it like a little smile, a little smirk or something? Did yeah, it kind of look like that to you? Yeah, yeah. Like he. Yeah, I don't know. He came to peace with what he wanted to do. Or like, whatever, man. yeah. But uh, I was thinking of something too. I was like, uh, with the last situation with the police officer, mm -hmm. just imagine how many police officers has done crazy things like that yeah. and then they try to be that that person in the community everybody come to and it, but yeah. they have so many skeletons in yeah. their closet and then those are the people who, who we enlist to trust on a day-to-day -day basis and Fact. and there's a lot of police officers gets caught up in scandals you're in you're out and it just makes it hard to you know what i'm saying 100 trust them yeah so the footage shows what should have been an impossible scenario as an unnamed 48-year-old man was standing at the edge of the most powerful waterfall on the planet, somehow staying balanced and remaining fully calm despite being just one foot away from dropping over 180 feet to certain death. Unsure of how the man had ended up in the water or how it was even possible for him to stay upright, Rescue workers sprang into action with two men, Pop Moriarty and Gary Carella, sliding into the water and attempting to walk towards him. But even for them, the current was just too much, forcing them to almost immediately turn back, while the man yelled to them that he was losing his strength and to not let him go over. To aid in the rescue, a helicopter was sent in to try and airlift the man up, but immediately the force of the rotors began to create strong gusts of wind, leading to this. I think they got too low. Oh jeez, oh jeez, oh Grab the rope. I think they, they got too low. I don't think they even had to get that. Now the man lay there, feet dangling over the edge of the falls, as the freezing cold water pelted him relentlessly. By this point, that man had already been in the water for over one hour, and his grip was slowly slipping. And so, in a last ditch prayer, a rescue worker inside the helicopter decided to toss a life preserver, knowing that this would likely be their final shot at saving him and miraculously, the current caught it and brought it directly to him. With every bit of strength he had left, the man would let go of the rock he was clinging to and lunge towards the preserver, grabbing a hold of it as crews on shore began to pull him to safety. Or at least they thought. Oh, as he was being towed to shore, the man approached what looked to be land, though in actuality, this was an ice shelf that extended out over the water. Meaning that the black line you see here isn't actually land, oh but instead God. a small opening between the sheet of ice and the water itself. And within that small opening, the rapids were raging at tenfold due to the increased pressure of the small size. And so while the man was being pulled towards rescue workers, he was almost immediately sucked underneath, pinning him in an immovable situation. Mariardi and Corella knew that they had to engage once again, or else the man was certainly going to drown, with their testimony later on showing just how dire the situation had become. He just told us, let me go. He just gave up. He said, save yourselves, let me go, let me go. But the rescue crews had come too far to just give up. And despite the pressure of the water becoming almost too much to bear, Corella slipped a harness around the man and gave the signal for the group to be lifted up. That's what's up, My man. goodness. 
That's Somehow, crazy. they had all done the impossible, and with the victim now on solid ground, he was taken to a nearby hospital where despite suffering from severe hypothermia, he would go on to survive, making it one of the most incredible rescues ever shown on television. But with the victim now safe, it was time to figure out what exactly had happened. Thanks. Well, apparently, the man had lost all of his money due to a crippling gambling addiction, even gambling away the last of his family's own cash, losing everything and everyone in the process. And he entered the water that day, hoping to make it his last. But as he drifted towards the edge, he suddenly had a change of heart and decided to fight for survival. And somehow, when trying to stop himself, his foot became lodged in between two rocks, which also aided in shielding him from the rushing current, allowing him not only to stay there, but to stand upright. It's unknown what happened to the man from here, as he's understandably never been named publicly, but I do hope he managed to find some peace and purpose, as his story is one of very few of this nature with a happy ending, especially within Niagara Falls, as the area has become a hotspot for attempts just like this, the vast majority of which sadly end successfully. And as it turns out, one such example of this was captured when the cameras happened to be rolling. I want to watch that. Frazier that recorded the man's actions as he was taken. Hey, now, if this get dire, uh, it will be cut. I can't, you can't risk it. Yeah. But honestly, the way he got trapped the way he did, <laughs> it wasn't meant for him. No. So that's the reason why he survived that situation. Yeah. Because it wasn't meant for him. To get trapped and your foot to get lodged in between two. And they yeah. wondering like, how is this possible? I, right, if one for him to even have survived, then to be yeah. standing upright like this, and then and the, the amount current, of time, yeah. and how strong it was, yeah. That's crazy. Special program with Phil Cabots. It is Phil's voice you will hear on the tape. Factories, hotels, and other buildings line the river. As TV host Phil Cabots is recording a program for the local nightly news in Buffalo, New York, he did so near the mouth of Niagara Falls, where the rapids are raging in a particularly fearsome manner. When suddenly... Buildings line the river. Then, Frederick Olmsted started a campaign to persuade... Oh my gosh. We see a man come running from the brush and leap directly into the water. For obvious reasons, I can't show what happens next as the water begins to sweep the man towards the edge of the falls. But the audio alone is sufficient in showing just how traumatic the moment was for the news crews watching on. Factories, hotels, and other buildings line the river. Then, Frederick Olmsted started a campaign to persuade New York to buy the land. Oh my god! Holy sh Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh! As they watched in horror, the man was dragged to the edge and then swept directly off, going over head first and standing no chance of survival. According to the report, the man was never identified and his body was never found, likely having been pinned by the impossible force of the water at the bottom. But what I find most chilling about this video is the fact that it's only seemingly been archived in this poor quality which makes deciphering details about it incredibly difficult. True. However, there were many who watched the program on TV the day after, as the news station actually aired this footage for the world to see. And one particular account has haunted me since the moment I first read it. I remember seeing this when it was first broadcast. Freaked me the hell out. It wasn't a worn out videotape back then, and the image was a lot cleaner. The guy looked at the news crew and into the camera when they started yelling. Creepy and sad as hell. Despite being known for its beauty, there is a dark side to this amazing location, and one that has become, and likely will remain, no stranger to the world of television. That's sad, man. Very much so. Very much Just imagine sad. how many people actually go there just for that. Yeah. And, you know what I'm saying, you got people visiting from all over, families, kids, older people. It's just going there for the, and then people do like things like that. That doesn't scar somebody from life for life to see that. Most definitely. And I understand, bro. It's but you understand what? No. What? No. Well, what I was gonna say is the fact that for I guess a lot of people because you don't know like his family if he 
was his family like staying in the area he was in because he was never identified yeah or whatever the case may be so that's sad in itself like i'm wondering is his family look was his family looking for True. him or you know whatever the case may be True. didn't know what happened they may have seen the news thing didn't think it was him you know the and broadcast still and, and, and still, still don't probably know don't know whatever happened to him nobody was ever recovered yeah that's sad now that's that's for sure sad yeah. he could have had kids Whatever. Don't know how old, young, they just middle know age. Oh, you don't know. Gone and never heard from again. Parents. Nope. nope. That's sad. But you never know, man. I'll, yeah, these are sad. Yeah, yeah. Y'all spam us up, man. Y'all let us know y'all thoughts about it in the comment section down below, man. This, these were very devastating for very real, much bro. So. Especially the ones that you never locate a body. Ooh, that pastor, bro. That was. Oh, yeah. They ate. And you know what I'm saying? Only thing you have left is the bottom half. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The Catholic, uh, yeah. yeah. And luckily, oh, the one yeah. guy, you know what I'm saying? Even though he felt like life was over, mm. he had that last second decision. And like you can only imagine what what's going through someone's head at the time of like near death or yeah, yeah, a yeah, death yeah. experience. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's sad. Man. Y'all spend what's up, man. Let us know y'all thoughts about it in the comment section down below. But as always, I do go by the name of Jimmy Kidd. This is